Open the pod bay doors now. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. So uh, I'm going to be running the microphone. I'll be I'll be up and down the steps. Uh, I've got questions for the panelists in case you don't, but I want to know what you're curious about. Remember, we have a psychologist, we have a film professor, we have a geneticist, and we have an economist here to offer their views and perspectives. What do you what what kind of questions do you have after seeing that movie? We got a question way back there. We need to record it for posterity. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to get my cardio in tonight. Here we go. Double time. Take it away. So at the beginning of the film, the family seemed like the sister was looking for the little brother and seemed completely unfazed by the fact that or it didn't seem like the kid was like crazy before he just went crazy. So my question is for the psychologist. Is that possible that one day your little brother could just go <laughs> insane and then kill you? <laughs> Oh, the reason I ask is because in other films, like The Bad Seed and things like Good Son, the kid's kind of crazy throughout, you know, the mother always suspected, but that wasn't the case in this movie. Are you worried about anyone in particular? Maybe. Okay, maybe. I suppose right. anything's possible, um, but I think you're right. In the most cases, then, when we see children who have significant uh, conduct problems, so certainly up to and including murder, uh, that there are, there are signs before Is that, that how murder is classified now as a conduct problem? <laughs> <laughs> well, so what we see, we see actually two different patterns of what we call conduct problems, so essentially behavioral problems, violence, those sorts of things in children and adolescents. And one is what we call adolescent limited, so kids who get into drugs and problems and whatever in adolescence and kind of come through it all right after that. And then we see what we call childhood onset conduct problems that is typically a pattern that starts really, really early. So kids who have problems from very early on that kind of escalate over time. And they saw a few things like uh, you know, hurting animals and those sorts of things. We don't get told a lot about whether that was going on before. But you're right, that it wouldn't be typical for him to just snap and then be completely different one day. Rob, could you talk a little bit about the heredit heredity of, of these kind of traits? Well, we certainly know that there are genetic predispositions for neuropsychiatric conditions, um, things like depression, anxiety, um, and then even farther into the spectrum when you're looking at uh, there's genetic predispositions for autism and other neurodevelopmental disorders. Um, but even in a more simplistic sense, there are variations in the genome in our genes that code for things like neurotransmitters or the receptors on cells that actually bind those, take them into the cells, and allow those transmitters to, to act. We know there are genetic variants that can be predispositions for things like anxiety disorders. Um, so there's definitely a genetic contribution to things like fear um, and, in some cases, to neuropsychiatric conditions. Very interesting. What other questions do you have for our panelists? All the way over here. I knew it was going to be on the opposite side. Sorry, I got I to gotta do the movie shuffle here. Sorry, sorry. Excuse me. Pardon me. Sorry, sorry. Pardon me. Excuse me. And I got to come up there. Don't worry. I'll get there in a second. Longer than a second. Where were you? You were all, okay. You were there. I almost missed you. Sorry, excuse me, pardon me, pardon me, excuse me, pardon me. Uh, this is a question for Dr. Green. Um, in the part of the film, John Carpenter talked about the steady cam, which Kubrick used in The Shining as well. Um, why this method, why is this so common in horror films as opposed to like a handheld cam, which would create chaos on the screen? I mean, I, I think that's kind of interesting. And first of all, I think both of them are using it very early. And so these are early instances where um, you get this sense of sort of a gliding presence. And I was thinking about Kubrick, too, because he uses it in a very different way in The Shining to suggest um, from the very opening, you, you don't have a steady cam, but you have that helicopter shot that follows Jack down. And you get a miniature version of that following Danny through the halls of The Shining. And it almost suggests, like, a supernatural presence in that film. Here, 
I think that you do get a lot of handheld shots, certainly, fr um, but I think that what he's doing is very different with it. He wants to suggest a human presence that is just off screen, kind of lurking constantly. <laughs> um, and it allows him in the opening to make this really kind of smooth tracking shot. But he does, it's interesting, because he doesn't want to suggest that this is a supernatural creature, but it is somebody who moves very quickly, who can be anywhere at once. And so I think he gets that kind of sense of, um, su well, he does actually like say, Michael is supernatural or has supernatural qualities. He gets m Michael those kind of abilities to disappear, to reappear. Um, in within a shot, like at one point, Annie walks across the screen and Michael's gone when he had just been standing behind her. And so he, I think that the steady cam maybe allows to suggest that Michael moves that quickly and that smoothly. And nobody notices him too. Like he's literally standing a foot away, but nobody sees him. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Very nice. Now, oh, perfect. Hi. Um, Actually, uh, this question isn't so much about this version of Halloween, um, it's about the remake, but um, I think that this question may have to do with this version. Um, I think it's at the beginning of Halloween 2, I think, um, something is shown on screen about White Horse that, uh, that Michael Myers has. Um, I was just wondering, like, uh, what exactly is White Horse, and um, is, is it like some like mental disorder, and um, it's like a... a I just I just haven't like like heard like a lot about it. Uh, are you talking about the Rob Zombie remake or the sequel to The Carpenter? Um, I'm uh, I'm talking about like uh, Rob Zombie's uh, Halloween Two. Oh, I've yeah, not seen. Um, I kind of stopped with Rob Zombie after the first one, so I'm not really sure what um, psychiatric <laughs> disorder he's talking about. Sorry. That's not something that sounds familiar to me, and I also haven't seen the movie. So. <laughs> We've seen this movie. It's possible, he, I mean, it's possible that something, uh, Zombie fills in, in the first one, a lot of blanks that are left, that Carpenter even says, like, I don't know why he's killing people in the introduction to the film. doesn't matter. And I think for Zombie, it actually does. And so he goes back and fills in all that familial history, incorrectly, I think, in some cases, um, of the Strode family and tries to explain why Michael's actually killing. Where I think for Carpenter, it doesn't matter. Uh, I actually have a question. Oh, Rob, you were going to fill well, in. And, Go ahead. Yeah, and I was just going to piggyback onto that, that I think that is really kind of an interesting distinction between the originals and the remakes, is that mm -hmm. they provide so much information in the remakes that you can actually pick apart the science a little more of those, because in Carpenters, he really leaves it as supernatural. You're not supposed to get what's going on with Michael. He is a force of nature. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's interesting to look at this and try to put a, a science perspective on it, because in a lot of ways, it just doesn't fit at all. But it's much more successful than when you do put science on it in the remakes. And I have to agree with you, I didn't think they were nearly as good as the original. <laughs> uh, yeah, and I, good thing you're handing the microphone back to Lauren, because I had a, a, a question for you based, based on this. Uh, Michael Myers is a supernatural force, but is John Carpenter, like, trying to communicate something else about the, the late 1970s uh, in this movie, the, the socioeconomic conditions through these characters. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that um, horror movies are often a way for us to sort of explore our collective fear um, for, you know, various social phenomena. And there's certainly, um, I think, you know, at least two that are present in this film. Um, firstly is this idea of kind of uh, you know, the scourge of drugs and um, sexual liberation. So the first people who are kind of killed are the, the sort of bad acting teenagers, um, while Lori remains, you know, Lori, who is much more kind of wholesome seeming, remains um, survivor. Uh, it's, I thought it was also interesting how, you know, the kind of two main weapons that Lori uses are the knitting needle and the um, hanger. Yeah, these two very domestic uh, kind of objects. Uh, which brings me to the second kind of social phenomena that um, I think uh, was present in the m movie, and this is this, you know, it was made in this period when um, women were increasingly in increasing numbers joining the labor force, uh, and I think you know we can definitely see that theme throughout um, this kind of focus on the fact that they're all kind of babysitting, right? So if you compare it to the the um, relationship between Michael and his older sister that kind of starts off the movie in the 1960s where the relationship is kind of a sibling relationship. When we get to um, uh, Laurie and her counterparts, 
uh, you know, we still have this relationship between the older women and the younger children, but now it's an employment relationship to some extent. Um, so I think there are definitely, uh, you know, social themes that are at play um, as well. Very interesting. I should stop asking questions because I'll hog it. Uh, anyone, what else are you curious about? Uh, over here, you're just one row down, and then I'll get to you. Excuse me, pardon me, pardon me, excuse me, pardon me, pardon me, excuse me. Here you go. So this doesn't exactly have anything to do with the movie. It's just more of a fear Halloween aspect. Why is it that if death is just so ever-present in our society and it's kind of expected in terms of it's unavoidable, we're all going to die at some point, why is it so feared and so revered as something that's supernatural and something that's to be feared when we're all going to deal with it eventually? Everyone's looking at Katie. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it's a complex question. There's a lot that might be going on. I think part of it is that sense of the unknown um, in terms of you know, we have this consciousness, we process everything in, in our world through our own consciousness. So that sense that an event could happen to us that we then can't process with our own consciousness I mean, is very mysterious and very uh, fearful, perhaps. Um, and so I think that that lack of understanding that we, we strive to try to understand and that you know a, a lot historically people think about re religion across the world as attempts to understand and explain the world, explain the unknowable and particularly explain death, and that we have all of these various ways of explaining it, but also a lot of fear around it and a lot of ritual around it that attempts to explain some of those pieces and cope with them in, in culturally specific ways as well. Uh, I have a follow-up question. Actually, I have two. I have one for Rob, or I have one for Jane. Who should I ask? It's two different Jane, questions. Should Jane. I ask? I'm volunteering, Jane. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, yo, going. Uh, it's an excellent point. It's okay to go beyond this specific film uh, in topics of the panel and ask them about fear in general. How is you know death is a major part of our life. Yeah. Uh, how is it portrayed? How is this handled in film in general? Well, God, that's a huge question. Um, you have 45 yeah. seconds. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think that one of the ways that we, that I study the horror film in, in the classes that I teach is historically, and I think that it changes across time, like what people are afraid of causing their death. Um, and cultural historians sp are very interested in sort of saying like, um, where does the monster, where does the threat come from? Is it far away? Is it a foreign threat? You know, like Dracula, who's, you know, away um, in Transylvania and comes into our land. Or is it right next door? Or, you know, like Norman Bates? Or even closer, is it Michael Myers? Like, so I think the, the, the kind of nature of death, like how the monster kills you changes, the nature of the threat, um, over time, and maybe that does say a lot about what we fear, you know, like the, the recent sort of zombie renaissance, for example, like are we all of a sudden really afraid of being eaten alive by the undead? Like, I, but I mean, I think that zombies are a, much more of an analogy for something else or a metaphor or whatever it is. Um, so, yeah, and then we were, we were talking beforehand about like torture porn, like where does that come from? Are we all afraid of not just dying instantly or at the hands of like a, a kind of masked killer, but now we're afraid of like being tortured to death or, or being forced to like kill ourselves in the process of escaping, like that sort of thing. Um, so I'm not sure if I'm answering your question. I think it changes depending the on the era. The question may not have an answer. Uh, and, Rob, and, go and ahead. Yeah, and since you're picking on me, I'll piggyback onto that because I, I think it's a really interesting question in a scientific sense because there's tons of science into studying how to keep us alive. You know, all these different pathogens, viruses, bacteria, fungi, cancer, ways to avoid that, understanding how those processes happen, how we might change them. There's a fair amount understanding after we die what happens to our bodies, all, uh, typically in a forensic sense. How do our bodies break down? How do we decompose? Um, but there's very little study into that actual moment of death. One, because we've decided ethically you can't do that, um, and, and two, I think because in a lot of ways we're afraid of that. So I think there's a gap in our scientific knowledge about that phenomenon. So that leaves us with an unanswered question and that scares us. We have tons of knowledge 
pull out your phone, start doing some searching. After, after the panel. After the panel. But I think it's a lot of those things that we don't have information on that inherently scare us. How's it going, man? Pretty good. You st did I steal your question? Okay, here you go. Okay, so most um, movies in general, song plays a very big part and a role to give you your emotion. Why in horror movies specifically does the music cause so much fear? So I think some of it may be what we call a conditioned response. Um, so when you think about a conditioned response, what it means is you have a, a response that's uh, natural, that's unconditioned. So feeling fearful when something startles you, for example. And then if you have something that's consistently precedes that, so whether it's a particular uh, stimulus of another sort, like music of a particular type, if that's consistently preceding something that's naturally fearful, you essentially learn to start fearing the thing that comes before even though it, it wasn't fear-provoking in the first place, that you're, you are anticipating that, and that fear starts to be attached to what comes first. So I think from a psych perspective, that would be my explanation. So like, the, 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 when you hear that, he's conditioned you to automatically say Michael's around somewhere. Pavlov's dog. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Very excellent question. We got a question down here in the man with the yellow beret. Or is that a beret or is it a different kind of what kind of hat is it? I don't know what you call it. Okay, just hat. Just a hat. Just a hat. Yeah. Okay, so my question is, um, why was the late seventies such a breeding ground for horror? I mean, you have Craven, you have Kubrick, you have Carpenter, I mean Polanski. Everybody's making these epic movies that have this long longevity. I mean, is it uh, economic, social issues? Is it technology advancements? I mean, what, what's your take on that? I think there's a, a couple of things coming into play, and I actually think it starts slightly earlier, like early to mid 70s, but then it explodes in the late 70s and 80s. But in the early 70s especially, you have a lot of concerns about like the nature of evil and that actually even comes out of changes like um, in Catholic doctrine in the late 60s there's a lot of interest in um, new age religions um, the church of uh, Satan actually comes out in like 68 almost the same year that there's a time magazine cover called God is dead and I think you see that playing out most clearly in the kind of demonic children films like Rosemary's Baby the Exorcist the Omen and I, but I think this is linked to this because it is, you know, he says that Michael is evil. Um, so I think there's that going on, this loss of faith and nothing yet to replace it. So this fear of um, how will we cope with evil um, in an age that's sort of post-religion. But I also think there's, aside from the cultural explanation, there's very much um, an institutional explanation having to do with the rise of ancillary markets, which Carpenter actually suggested. Um, the first cable satellite in the late 70s and then VHS in the, the 80s, there's an explosion. And it offers these filmmakers a chance for profits that you know, they had, had heretofore been un unheard of, either through um, theatrical and then ancillary release or just straight to video. And suddenly you have poof, an explosion. And that's how I think most of us probably experienced the films originally as like at home on television. So there's a market for it, and I think there's also like, um, there's a lot of fears it's tapping into. Yeah, Lauren. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, you also mentioned economic and social issues at the time. Um, I think, you know, there's the, that era was kind of ripe for um, these kind of fears attacking what had traditionally been this very, you know, hallmark part of, of society. So, you know, in this movie, for example, we have this kind of, you know, masked creature stalking the suburbs, this previously kind of very safe zone um, in American society. Um, and, you know, I think that has a lot to do with, with sort of what was going on at the time in terms of um, the dismantling of the traditional family. Very cool, I, I have to go up there. Okay. It was inevitable, because I went to the lowest person possible. I know, I know. I can tell. <laughs> so my question is, what is it about Michael Myers that makes him such an effective villain? Like, he's faceless, silent, 
What is it about that that makes him so frightening? So I think that faceless and silent piece is a huge part of what does in fact make him so frightening is that, that piece of the unknown. Um, if you have somebody who's talking, who's explaining themselves, even if they're not directly explaining themselves, you can start to guess at motives and get ideas about how this might happen or how it might not happen. You know, if you can explain how something can happen, you can convince yourself that it wouldn't. Um, but if you have no explanation and you've been given no explanation of any kind, it makes it much harder to explain it away. Yeah, or reason with him, should he be standing in front of you with a knife. So. It, uh, Rob, is there something uh, like biological in that reaction, like not having a face, not having a name, that we kind of primally uh, respond to? Well, I think it kind of suggests what um, these guys were saying, that when you have this blank slate, you don't know how to interact with it, you, you, and, and you don't know how to stop it. And as an audience member, you know, if you see Godzilla coming towards you, you, you sort of immediately know, oh, well, you could try, drop a bomb on him. Or if you see a ghost, oh, pull out your proton pack. Or we have these set ideas with monsters, what items you could use to stop them. But with something like this, especially when it first came out, you don't know what he is. Or why he's doing it. Yeah, or why he's doing it. And, and I'm kind of curious, why do you think, I'd actually forgotten this, and, and I have owned a copy of this forever, I'd forgotten that Carpenter unmasks Michael yeah, at one yeah, point. Yeah. And I'm curious, why do you think, even though Carpenter feels he's a force of nature, why do you think he actually unmasks him and gives him a, a human face yeah, then? I don't know. I always forget about that moment myself, and I'm not really sure why he chooses to do it. I think it's a mistake myself. Like... I don't know, but then it, it is. You've been. I think you've been wanting to see it for a while, and so when the mask comes off, there's this. Oh, he's just a man, yeah. sort of moment. Um, that almost makes it scary. Like you see, you've, you've built him up in your in your head about what's behind that mask, and it's going to be like really crazy. And then it's just, oh, he's like a young guy. Um, so I don't know. I think there's this sense with the facelessness and the silence that it's a real violation of our social norms too. I found the, one of the most uncomfortable moments of the movie is when he's standing there with the sheet over himself yeah. and just not responding. And that that, that really violates our, our social norms and expectations that when we speak to somebody, they're supposed to respond back in some way. And I think it, it makes us almost viscerally uncomfortable for somebody to violate that norm in, in such a fashion. There's no kind of reading his expression, so you don't know, is he mad at me? Is he, like, is he responding in any way? Like, one of the, I always thought the creepiest moments in the film is when he has the guy hung up, um, hanging in front of him, and he just sort of, like, <laughs> it, like, mm, that was a good work. Um, but you don't know. It's just, like, this very creepy um, contemplation um, that goes along with, again, this creepiness about not knowing who is he, what does he look like, what does he want. But it's nice that he has Dr. Loomis as an external source to kind of sell how absolutely evil he is. So when he does something like just tilt his head, you've had Loomis describing all of this terrible way he is, and then that, that, that his experience yeah. then kind of sells you on it when you yeah, see Yeah, you're that. right. From the perspective as, as somebody who's done therapy, I'm really curious about how Dr. Loomis came to his ideas that Michael is completely <laughs> evil. Because he says that Michael has never spoken a word to him, and he's been locked up in an institution, presumably, since this murder happened. So what exactly could he have perpetrated in that period of time that's convinced him that he's so evil? I'm very curious about what Dr. Loomis's rationale and the backstory that, enga that they engaged in over that seven or eight years of therapy that he said he attempted with him. And how did he learn how to drive a car? That's yeah. a big question. All right, right up here. How did they get out of the, like, how does he escape? Uh, the know. audience There's asks questions here. In Anyone? This panel. <laughs> I did have a, a question. We'll get to you, don't worry. You're cool. Uh, I did have a question. Uh, you brought up this, this cool concept of breaking, like, social norms and expectations uh, to make someone scary. Isn't sometimes the exact same thing played for laughs? Like when s people break social norms and expectations, we find it funny. Like what is the difference between making something scary and making something funny in terms of breaking social norms? Well, there's actually, oh, I think I broke my microphone. <laughs> Katie has a microphone too. Okay, sorry. There's actually a really interesting article by a uh, film philosopher, I guess, called by Noel no Carroll called Horror and Humor. And one of the things he argues is that 
monsters um, have kind of a, their root, they're, they're threatening, and they're also impure. So there's something incongruous about them. They're wolf and man. They're dead and alive. Um, and he acknowledges that actually humor has incongruity as its basis too. Something unexpected happens. The difference is that um, in comedy, when something unexpected happens, it's a pleasant surprise. Um, but in horror, there's something very displeasurable about it. There's something impure and, and threatening as well. But he speculates that's actually why people find clowns threatening, is that there's something inherently sort of interstitial or impure about clowns. They're sort of genderless. Um, there's usually something um, exaggerated or wrong with their appearance, a giant nose, big hands or feet. Um, their faces are painted expressionless or a fake expression is painted on them, so you can't read them as well. So he says that's why I think if people find clowns scary when they're not walking around stalking you, it's because they're potentially interstitial already. They're, they're incongruous. So all you need to add is like a hint of a threat and clowns become terrifying. There you go. I, I actually thought um, the moment that you said was the weirdest moment with the she, I actually found that kind of funny because he's <laughs> standing there with the glasses over top and they're kind of askew. That's I true. mean, it was almost clown-like and then it sort of made me think back to the, the beginning moments when he's first discovered and we first see Michael Myers as a kid and he's got the clown costume on. Um, yeah. Very cool. Very nice point. Um, so I apologize, I wasn't here for the talk at the beginning or really didn't see the video. So. You didn't miss anything. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I just think it's, it's interesting. It's like, how, what did Carpenter tap into? Because you know, he's credited with this sort of being the first in the slasher kind of series that started, right? And in terms of like horror movies, and even horror movies that had a bit of gore or, because it's not particularly violent, um, even compared to something like Last House on the Left or something like that. But, you know, combining this sort of violent thing with the sexy stuff and, I, you know, why was it, why was the time right and why did that, why did this start the slash thing? Why, why was he the person? Why hadn't somebody else? And I guess, you know, somebody has to do it, but just the fact that this formula sort of was repeated for, you know, at least a decade or so thereafter and then, you know, evolved from, from there. But I, I don't know. That's, maybe that's not a good question, more of a comment, but. It's an excellent question. Uh, oh, okay. So, well, I mean, it's interesting that Carpenter in the, in the introduction actually says, oh, it got terrible reviews, because actually it got a fair share of good reviews. Like, Siskel and Ebert both loved it, they, and, it and it's a very well-crafted film. And he mentions this. It was a very, uh, still, I think, based on return for investment, it's one of the most profitable films of all time. And so he kind of suggests there one reason, which is basically like suddenly producers say, wow, young, semi-naked, fully naked people getting you know, slaughtered on screen will get the kids in in droves. And then when, especially again with satellite, um, cable and VHS, you can make a mint. So I think this is one reason. Now, why they're actually popular with this crowd, like why people are actually going to see um, slasher films. I don't know. There's, I think there's a lot of reasons for it. Um, Siskel and Ebert actually have a very famous episode where they um, don't review any films. They take a stand against all these repetitive slasher films because they find them very misogynistic. And so they see them as um, indulging a lot of... Um, fears about women, putting women in their place, but other people argue that the films are very progressive in their representation of especially the final girl um, and Laurie being the first, but later final girls are even more active, save themselves, fight the monster. So um, in that sense, you could say it's tapping into an audience that likes to see a, an active female protagonist. You guys made very good points that the Michael Myers is, is faceless and that's what makes them scary. Like, some of our fears, we can put faces we can identify. Uh, what are some of the faceless fears in our lives uh, or as a society that we face, and, and how are movies like this addressing that? Um, from a, a human uh, a medical perspective, um, I, I think cancer is a good faceless killer. Uh, it's the kind of thing that hides within us. Frequently, we don't see any outward signs that we have it, Yet, in a lot of cases, it is this killer that eventually can manifest and kill us. Unlike, say, a virus where you get symptoms. If you have a fungus, you'll have more overt symptoms. Um, uh, but bacteria is the same way. But a cancer, 
that grows within you for a long time festering until it overwhelms you. So I, I think that's kind of a, a faceless uh, killer that I, I could put an analogy on with Michael. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, I think people view a lot of social threats as kind of these faceless, um, you know, omnipresent fears. Um, watching this movie, I was kind of struck by how, you know, pertinent it is today. <laughs> um, the same kind of, you know, things that I think, um, the same themes that are represented as faceless fears back then in the 70s. I think a lot of that is kind of part of the current discussion in the current election cycle, especially. Um, so these issues of like, you know, female, the role of females mm -hmm. in the movie, um, the dismantling of American society, mm -hmm. um, the, uh, you know, women entering the labor force and potentially sort of emasculating men in some sense. Um, so I kind of, saw all those as, as being represented by Michael in this film, and I was shocked at how kind of relevant it still is today. Uh, okay, so it seems like Michael has a certain target. Uh, he seems to target young women uh, in their 20s. He doesn't target the children at all, and I thought that was really interesting and almost like a redeeming quality for him. So I was wondering if anyone had any comment on that. People certainly have talked about the films as being quite reactionary in that Michael seems to punish, especially young women who are sexual, who are outspoken, who break sort of taboos by smoking and drinking, that kind of thing. Um, later iterations of, of both Halloween, uh, Friday the 13th, all of the kind of slasher films, he, the gender balance starts to even out. They start to kill a lot of men as well as women, although the argument would be that women's death on screen is more prolonged. Um, and again, I think that's why people see these being as being misogynist. But it's interesting that, yeah, I've never thought about I always thought he'd get to the kids, so. Katie. He killed the dog. Katie's reaching for that microphone. Wrap it up for us, Katie. You know, I thought that there was an element of parallel between the kids and Michael as a child, though, as well. That in that, you get that shot of him as a, a clown standing there looking, despite what he'd just done, sort of helpless and a little bit befuddled. And then almost your next scene is this young boy about his same age on Halloween. So I felt like there was perhaps some identification with the kids. And that, I, I don't know, the idea that perhaps his development had kind of been arrested at that point, that this event, he stopped speaking, he stopped moving forward, and that perhaps in some way he felt like he identified with these kids, um, but was pushing back against these um, older women that he saw similarly to his sister as neglecting, um, being more concerned about the boyfriends and all of that rather than, than the children. All right, excellent. Thank you so much, everyone. Give a big hand to our panelists.